maybe he's got the last. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a talking head. Well, this one's like a murdery one. I can take that creativity and build on top of it. We need to do is make this easier and more accessible to build a low code experience on top of that. The capabilities of these systems are changing. Cool bed back then. Hey friends, I'm Scott and it's Build After Hours. There's still more content even now and into the afternoon. We left Kevin Scott, we saw Into Focus with AI and low code and collaborative apps. And in fact, Kayla finished her computer, talked accessories with Felicia. I'm actually gonna check in with her a little bit later and see how that's going. Maybe Kayla will build me a machine as well. I told you I'd take you behind the scenes. I'm gonna show you all the cool stuff that we're working on here. Around me, we've got three pedestals. We've got one jib, one steady cam, five cameras in total hanging out here on the build stage. They told me I can walk over to the screen here. Check this out. This is actually an LED wall. This LED wall is in fact four K screens, three 4K screens with 11,520 pixels in width. This is not really Seattle. I'm not supposed to touch it, but they can't stop me because it's live TV, which is pretty, pretty cool. This is, in fact, one of three studios used for Microsoft Build. We're going to go behind the scenes all afternoon. Do stick around because it's Build After Hours. Uh, it'll be, it's about shifting interactions and interfaces from being explicit to more implicit. You know, today, a computer is very explicit. Mm -hmm. You almost have to, you know, program it and use it in a very explicit manner. But the way I interact with you is very implicit. Mm -hmm. I'm fuzzy. You can't tell a computer to wear a black shirt and then have it go figure that out. Where you're now using AI and machine learning to essentially bring that level of uh, implicitness to uh, your interactions with your applications. People expect life and their interactions to be fuzzy. If I tell my computer, hey, uh, set up an appointment with my wife for lunch right. on a Tuesday at the movies near us, you know, you know, that one movie theater by the crossroads. I'm always disappointed that the computer didn't get that. But it will, it will absolutely will. The things that are happening now in our office applications, uh, you know, powered by these large models that run in Azure, it's amazing, I mean, predicting the next few words that I'm typing. That is phenomenal. That's like, already starting to show up. Yeah. I, was, I was running right. Edge and I was writing some email and suddenly yeah. it started giving me the next yeah. 15 words. And I was like, when did they add that? Like document summarization, they're solving riddles that like people can't solve. Searching with pictures. Yeah. Um, combining oh. multimodal picture and text together to find something. This is like human level parody things that are happening. But you need a lot of compute to make that happen, which is why this hybrid model between cloud and edge is so important. You want the computer to essentially help understand what you're trying to do and just do it for you and have it be right. And, and that is what AI is going to bring to everyone. We're walking into the inclusive lab right now where, you know, some of these things really come together nicely. Hello. Oh, hi, Solomon. Hello. Welcome. Oh, hi. How's Hello. it going? I'm going well. Good to see you. Welcome to the Inclusive Tech Lab, everybody. Perfect. Tell me how yeah. this do. Oh, work. my whole setup? Yeah. What, oh, wow. What I've got set up on here right now is actually the lighting control for the space. We can do full color control. Okay. I do Teams calls from here. This is how I keep up with my messages because I'm not at my desk, right. right? I'm in a lab, I'm doing stuff, I'm talking to people. Can you show us the adaptive kit over yeah. here that just came out? You and I on the right-hand side have similar mobility challenges with some repetitive stress injuries and some RSI. We've got the standalone mouse core, which is this little guy here, nice little travel-sized mouse. What makes it really cool, that slides off. We take this tail, we just snap it right on. And then that thumb rest can be taken out really easily and switched around or we can custom 3D print all sorts of different tails like we have here. I'll tell you what I like about this mouse. The optical tracking engine is right at the front of the device, which gives you a little more precision when you're trying to essentially manipulate it. So it puts the axis of rotation towards the front of the device rather than sometimes the middle. And you have to do the charging point yeah. around there. And we had yeah. to cant it enough that yeah. you could use it while it was plugged yeah, in. Yeah, that's some good engineering right there. Yeah. The thing that I'm really excited about with this particular device, I'm type one diabetic and I've got some implants and stuff and I've had bilateral 
bilateral frozen shoulder, and I've got some mobility challenges on the right side, as well as RSI yeah. and some nerve damage. I use a vertical mouse. Sometimes the ones right. that I buy aren't really vertical. They're kind of at a 45 degree angle, and I can start hurting just as I turn. I'm gonna be able to make whatever I want with 3D printed models. And as my body changes, mm -hmm. and as I either gain or lose mobility, I'm gonna be able to make this happen. And I'm also left-handed, <laughs> which is a challenge. So I'm gonna be able to make a left or a right-handed version with the right. same base. Right. It's so clever. Right. When you showed me this the first time, yeah. I thought that was the mouse. And yep. you're like, no, look at the tolerance. Let me show you that, yeah. <laughs> no. That is so nice. Everyone deserves quality, mm -hmm. tactile, right. accessible Well, that's devices. what we learned with the daughter of our lead designer. She has cerebral palsy, and mm -hmm. he built that shelf for her first. In the years since, she's grown. Her hands are bigger, and it's been a cinch to print newer, upsized versions for her, rather than having to go buy completely yeah. new hardware. And we're really excited about that, how the hardware can grow as your needs change. Yeah, go with that's you. so important. That is a custom hand just yes. for you. Having pieces that we can easily upgrade and swap out is so important, not just with orthotics, but you know, with this as well. We took that same approach here. So we were talking about NPUs earlier and mm. the fact that, you know, we're gonna have these like interfaces that are so much more intelligent with like AI coming in and making more intuitive, fuzzy gestures. And then you like mix that with these accessible accessories. What kind of magic can we do there? We can take something that is traditionally a very explicit interaction model, like I have to move this mouse exactly to this spot so I can click this button. And that is our interface today. That is basically the analogy of how we interact with computers today. But with the advent of more compute power on the device, with the advent of using Azure to essentially run these large models to help intuit what you're trying to do, you can move more to a very implicit sort of interaction model and say, you know, I want to do foo uh, rather than move this thing to mm -hmm. this icon and click that button. Yep. And that's really powerful. It makes computers easier to use for everyone. It yep. makes computers more efficient to use for everyone. I was talking to Dave Dame, uh, how cut, copy, and paste was such a revolution. That software technology enabled many people to do more things more efficiently because you didn't have to repeat those keystrokes all the time. Right. Take that analogy forward and now apply big AI on top of it. And you can kind of see that, you know, we're probably heading in a world where you'll be able to more naturally interact with computers the way we're interacting yeah. here to get stuff done. It's so programmatic right now. I'm not we... taking anything away from the programmer, but you know. No, no, but a friend of mine at, at a company called Code Rush wrote a tool that calculated the amount of energy, the amount of force oh, wow. that required to do a thing. Like, yeah. I want to compile. Okay, well, right. I can hit Control Shift B, and that's a thing. Or I can click up here and I can move the mouse. And he calculated everything the moving yeah. of the mouse. The thing. Yeah. And he's like, okay, the most efficient way would be one button. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not three, not a mouse, yeah. not yeah. a this. That stuff adds up. One of the really a large model, the billions of parameters that the company is working on with OpenAI is called Dolly. And Dolly can take natural language and create a picture. I have a picture of an owl sitting on a beach sipping a tequila. <laughs> right? like, <laughs> like, like, you can literally give that to Dolly and it will give you that image. It's crazy. Wow. In the future, we're going to look at the past and say, I would have had to have drawn that picture. Yeah. yeah. And it's co-pilot for art. That's yeah. right. And it doesn't mean like I can't apply my own creativity. I can take that creativity and build on top of it. Just like Dave was talking about cut, copy, and paste something and mm -hmm. then building on other people's ideas. Ideas, well, now I can build on top of AI, take my ideas and build on top of something, a palette that's already given to me. You make a really good point that it's not about taking away creativity. It's not about making it so we just right. are talking to the AI. It's about making the boring parts easier so we can focus that's on right. the fun stuff. That's right. That's and, just... and give you inspiration and building on other people's work. It's different tools. That's right. The intent's still the same. That's right. But yeah, to your point, Scott, Single button, we can do that now. The software now allows us to manually program those sorts of macros in where you can do really complex things with a single yeah. press yeah. and even multiple in sequence with that single press. But it'll be great when the system can actually start to learn those things on its own. And right. go, oh, I notice you're opening these things together at the okay. same yeah. time. Soon as you do one, all of it cascades. And that's really what we hear from the community is that kind of learning, that kind of adaptation of it molding around them is really what we hear desired a lot. How will MPUs proliferate the world? And you said, not too long, right? It's happening. Yeah. That's right. It's happening right now as we speak. I'm looking for that moment in time when I'm going to be like, I was there. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here, and I appreciate uh, both of you all spending time with us today at, awesome. uh, at Build After Hours. Thank you for showing us this amazing lab. Oh, appreciate my pleasure. It. Come back anytime, awesome. all of Perfect. you. We're always here. Thank you, Steve. Nice Thank talking you to you. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Bye.
I think you'll miss. Miss, 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 miss. I'm oh. not gonna miss. Oh, no. That was one hey, shot. Man. <laughs> Good to see you. Hey, how are see you? Around. How's it going? Hi, this is Felicia. Felicia. Nice to meet you. My friend Mary, she's awesome. We have between us now 17, well, 17 minutes mm. of experience throwing axes. Mm. I have zero, zero. minutes okay. of experience. 10, 15 between us. Let's. Can you help her pick an axe? Yes. I... This one's like a murdery one, so that's like <laughs> It's a murdery one? <laughs> Should yes, I just go I for it and see if I'm an actual? At the shoulder. Yeah. OK. All right, you all ready? Yeah. Okay, this is for. That was. That is. <laughs> oh, well. See? Okay. okay. Uh, so, this, I... this is my surgery arm, so bear with me. Oh, yeah. Look at his little show off. But, okay. Sure. Here we go. He's already claimed a shoulder injury. Oh, it's it. just a little bit like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> I should have asked coming in the door, but why do you want me here today, Scott? I feel, and I've talked to Felicia about this, that there's all the different VPs that like work all year and they build a thing and then they go and they talk about the thing. Yeah. But then there's all these other people who lead huge organizations mm. that no one has ever heard of. Mm that are taking the thing and getting it ready for the customer and prepping it for the customer and mm. explaining it to the customer. I do think about developers, like legit, like not because it's yeah, built. We, we talk I about think all about time. developers all the time. I think about trying to share what I hear when I go out to talk to CIOs and what they think about their developers. So we're mm. always thinking about how do we make sure the message is landing so that they're supported. Like that's at the end of the day. Now I have to take all that energy in your really- beautiful. This is the good one. Yeah, look, okay, there you go. Whoa, hey, hey, there you go. Okay, good. perfect. Do you have a bad shoulder too, or is that now a... Oh, oh you hit it right dead center. Dude. I am. Oh my goodness. See? All right, all right. Calm down, kids. Oh, oh it's getting so better. Good. There it is. Woo. Put that on the board, four points. Yeah, that's good. you're a lot better than me because <laughs> I have not yet hit one shot. Okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Max. We could, I, we could freeze frame that in post production and make that like a bullseye. Or Photoshop. <laughs> it's a developer world right now. We yeah. want to make developers happy. Yeah. We need to get out of their way. We need to make things easy for them to have all these secure security policies. We need it to be easier for them to tap into all of the old cold bases, the data over here, but actually the, that makes their life joyful. Like the tools have to be joyful. We can't make yes. them unhappy in their jobs. I was gonna say, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately is um, early in career developers, you know, mm -hmm. getting them set up. I've seen people feel like it took them three or four months before oh, they could write a line of code because setting up the environment, getting plugged in, all of the, the dashboard of their lives as developers is in some Word document somewhere. Right. Just right. like set up their laptop, the, the kind of mediocre laptop that they were given by their boss. Right. All that's gonna go away with DevBox, hopefully. Yeah, I think it'll go away. And I think it, it's, it's exactly the thing that you want, like CIOs and CTOs just cringe. Like they want their talent working on problems tomorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so these tools are both beneficial to developers, and then they're both beneficial to leaders who are like, gosh, you know, having developers sit around for three or four months without being productive is not good for our bottom line, right? Yeah. And so I think that's where all things come together. Then. The fact that we're having this conversation all holding ninja stars, I think is somehow significant. And we need to be throwing those ninja stars. Oh, yeah, do it, do it, do it. Ooh, ooh. Oh. I like that. <laughs> Funny, like, oh. oh. Oh, and here you go. Oh. Okay, okay. <laughs> what is it that you think Microsoft does well to allow people into the ecosystem? I think there's a lot of doors today, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because we just have such a robust portfolio. And yeah. so mm -hmm. I, I think we want to simplify, right? Yeah. But we also acknowledge people might be coming in from different places. And I think about like maybe some of the developers that are really in, been, you know, really into the Microsoft ecosystem for 20 years, they really understand it. And then you have another door for like low code oh, yeah. folks who are really ta tacking this onto their skill set, right? That's yeah. a really good example. Or we have new types of developers, you know, you have these like data scientists who are really getting into this, you know, yeah. ML kind of yeah. very specific space. So, you know, I think we have a big tent and I think we continue to grow that tent, but you know, what we need to do is make this easier and more accessible and more automated. And, yep. you know, that goes all to the simplification. We want to make devs' lives easier. Absolutely. Okay. All right, let's throw a couple more axes here. <gasps> oh, right, dead center. Stop it. All right, here we go. Ooh! Oh! What? Shut 
No! No! Scott, you can leave now. We have a new bullseye expert. Hey, hey friends, I'm Scott Hanselman and it's Build After Hours. We're here backstage on set with a couple of ancient artifacts, uh, myself, uh, this gentleman. But we do have newer things uh, like a copy of VisualStudio.net and Microsoft Bob. Now, if you had watched After Hours on day one, you would have noticed that not only did I abscond from the archives with a bunch of great t-shirts, uh, that I plan on returning, otherwise I'll lose my job. But I also snuck out with copies of Visual Studio going back 20 plus years, and I've snuck them around all over the set. However, these are different than they were yesterday. So you gotta go back to day one if you didn't notice and find those hidden copies of classic Microsoft software. We're gonna head over right now to see Kayla, who just finished her PC, has got it all booted up and ready for development. See if you spot any other Easter eggs as we move through uh, from Studio A to Studio D. Uh, these were all pulled out and borrowed from the Microsoft archives. Totally different ones were put in the hallway yesterday on day one. So be sure to check that out if you didn't see Build After Hours on day one. And thanks to the folks at the Microsoft archives for letting me have these t-shirts as well as these classic pieces of software that I actually worked on a couple of those. We're gonna sneak into Studio D where Kayla and Felicia are working on their PC and we'll see how it's going and see what they can share with us. Now we're gonna do the cool backwards walk that people do when they're live on something and try not to trip on anything. And then we'll say hi to our friends. Hello, friends. Hello. How are you? Oh, 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 oh. Check it out. It's, it's all done. This is Ada. This is Ada, named oh, after so Ada nice. Lovelace. Look at that. Yeah, so we've actually got it set up for development. So I installed Windows after the segment that we had and then um, put on some developer tools that I like to use regularly. So of course we have Windows Terminal and I have it customized to look just like builds um, backgrounds and I got that from the build website from the digital swag pack and I have Ubuntu installed as well for Windows subsystem for Linux and then I have Visual Studio Code for all of the documentation that I write I like to write it in VS Code um, and we have Visual Studio installed as well on the right and so I actually cloned the Windows Terminal GitHub repository and then built it using Visual Studio. So this terminal here front and center is the developer build of Windows Terminal. Now you used to build this on your uh, laptop. Yeah, so it took about like maybe 20 to 30 minutes depending on the oh, day wow. to build Terminal. And this one took about three to four minutes, which is a huge improvement, now, so like, I'm super excited. I've been telling you, we've been telling you like as your friend, like get a desktop <laughs> if you're gonna be really seriously producing. <laughs> yeah. What, like, what, why didn't you, why'd you wait to build your own PC? I don't know. So I always go back and forth between development and then doing other like program manager things. So it wasn't, it's not the main thing of my job. So I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll sit through it and I'll just triple check my code before hitting build. So I don't have to wait that time. And also I believe Visual Studio does a cache of the build. So it doesn't take as long right, a the second, second or third time afterwards. Um, but yeah, so this was a huge improvement and I was just so excited how quick it was to set up because it's just so fast. So what was your favorite part about the whole building process? Ooh, I think doing this, uh, inserting the CPU live was definitely one of the scariest things. A bunch of my friends were like, I can't believe you did that live on build. Like that is the scariest part to put in. It's like putting a heart in. Yeah, and then that spring that you have to lower down, you can't slip, otherwise you could damage the motherboard if, if it on your finger. So yeah. you get, really gotta make sure that you're pretty careful. And if you push that, 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 that lever down, it's like, you start pushing, it's like, I'm not supposed to push the, oh, and then it clicks, like, oh, I guess yeah. it worked. And then there's a loud snap, and no one tells you about the snap. <laughs> no one tells and then you I'm the like, snap. did I just snap the CPU? Like, how did I How did I do that? So that, that was definitely the coolest but scariest part of the entire build, I would say. That's awesome, but you're a convert now. You're like, desktop is the way. Oh yeah, I am so excited to get my hands on this and then trick it out with all my other tools. Are you gonna be lugging it to and from your work? <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't you know, think they, so. You, wait, wait, back, when, back in the day, we would do LAN parties before Wi-Fi and we would put a handle on top of them and you can get a strap and you can just lug it around. So you could do that, I'm just could saying. Do that. that would be pretty awesome to see you just walking around Microsoft campus with your <laughs> PC with as a suitcase. Yeah, exactly. 
Well, thanks so much, Scott, for coming. And thanks everyone for watching the Build a Windows PC segment. So what else or who else do you have coming up for your after hours show? We have got our new friend, Meethi, who's going to talk about the Power Platform. And we've got an actual very special conversation that we had with Kevin Scott in the yeah. 3D printing room, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so check us out, me and Felicia, on Build After Hours. So, Meethi and uh, Felicia, we are probably not supposed to be in sections of the studio. This is Microsoft Studios. I know that this is stage B. It says no event scheduled. We could probably sneak in here. Let's, Let's see. Go. Oh my god. Look at this oh, massive green. green screen. Meethi, you kind of have like green on your jacket. You're going to be. In. You're going to. You're going to be floating. You'll be a talking head. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Mithy. Hi. Hello. Um, so you work on Power Platform. I do. And we're putting the word power in front of a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, initially when you do that, it's branding. But now it's really cohesive. There's Power Automate, because Flow is Power Automate. There's Power Platform. There's Power Automate Desktop. But what is Power Pages? It's our newest member of the Power Platform family. Super exciting. It's actually, I'll let you in on the secret, Scott. It's not brand new. The low code experience is brand new. Mm. So, Power Pages stems from this capability from Power Apps called Power Apps Portals, which are essentially external websites that folks can build on business data that are still secure, still governable, still all of the stuff that's so important for making sure that our businesses can run smoothly. All of that existed. And we saw this growing need to build a low code experience on top of that so that it's not only developers with deep technical skills who can now build out these sites, everyone can. So when is it an app and when is it a power page? Yeah. There's like SharePoint where I can have like list of documents and static parts. Mm -hmm. Then there's like power pages, but then when does it become an app? So um, I think we're talking about similar-ish things, but think about the audience there, right? So when you build a power app, the audience is usually internal. Maybe it's your teammate. Maybe it's for yourself to take uh, to keep track of something that you were doing with paper before. And so that's a power app. Okay. But now you want to take this and provide some functionality or some um, expose some information to your external customers. And that's uh, where Power Pages comes in. So this is not something that's super brand new. The low code experience is new. All of the fun ways in which you can build this easier than ever. You can build it alongside subject matter experts and people who code for a living, the professional developers, so to speak. That's new, but the backing functionality, it's battle tested, it's highly scalable, it's out there in the world today. And then this is like the, the set. Doesn't everyone's house look like this? You this can is totally go up what my on kitchen that stage. Like. This is literally a stage. I thought that was 3D printed. It's not. Not everything is. Everything could be 3D printed. <laughs> this could be 3D printed. I don't know. You have to touch it first. That came from like Cost Plus. Is it, is it true you went to Vanderbilt? I did. And did you start a women in computing organization within Vanderbilt? I did. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so my journey to CS wasn't straightforward, which is interesting because I think a lot of people see me and Indian women, they expect that, of course, I always thought that I could go into CS and technology. Um, not the case. Did not grow up seeing a single woman in tech that I could look at and say that's something I want to do. And so I actually got into Vanderbilt thinking I'd be a mechanical engineer, discovered CS in my 101 class my very first semester, Bless that being a compulsory requirement. So <laughs> here I am in this class for the very first time um, studying what CS is, and I loved how logical it was. Um, fell in love with the subject, had a wonderful professor who just so happened to be female and gave me a lot of language to articulate how I was feeling in the field. Because I, you know, my first semester, I'm here, I'm surrounded by people who've perhaps been coding for a significant while longer. And so um, she was really uh, monumental to helping me realize that's, that's a very normal feeling to feel. And so cut to year two, I now see a whole batch of people coming in feeling the same way. And I'm like, we can fix this if there's a community. I want to replicate what that professor did for me, for everyone else who's coming in after. And so that's where Women in Computing came from. I also came in thinking I'll do some other kind of engineering. Mm -hmm. um, but I had studied CS in like school. I'd taken it as an elective. But even so, I remember coming in. And I remember thinking command line was so scary. <laughs> and you know, I didn't feel like the way I thought was necessarily the way I was supposed to be thinking. And the mm -hmm. questions I thought of weren't questions that came to these people's minds. And then I, you know, luckily found the intersection of 
user uh, empathy and product and CS, and I think that really fits me, but yeah. I relate so much to that story. Yeah, and that's why I love working on Flower Platform and business applications here because that's the story. Every time recently we uh, published a blog with like six makers who switched careers because they found Flower Apps, for example, and that, not to be corny, but that makes me teary-eyed because that's, that's real impact that we're having on the humans behind the tech and not just because it's cool technology we're building it. And so that's why I love the whole citizen dev notion, yeah. right? It's like opens up the, the space for anyone who doesn't have had that deep technical skill says come on in like come we've got in. the tools for you and when once you're ready we've got a path to support you to grow well thank you so much Meethi joshi for hanging out with us today thank you scott thank you felicia thank you for coming out and hanging with us it was real fun it was a lot of fun wow daylight <laughs> yo hey hey friends uh we are in building 99 and you are eating uh, as usual, which is the cool. Free little donut. It, free food is free food, right? Craft services. And uh, we're checking out uh, this workshop that we're going to interview Kevin Scott in. Mm. This is cool. Okay. If you... <laughs> After you. They've got lasers and CNC machines. Oh, this is a playground. You put this in your kitchen, right? Yeah. Just print out my sandwiches. I love how you're, you're making crossing, too much noise. You're Scott. crossing lines like this. I can't hear. It. Stop it. Stop. That could mean death. We this don't know what this means. This is great to keep around with you. Check this one out here. Let me get ahead again. Are, are we just gonna roll? We're already rolling. Okay, we're rolling. Hey friends, we're here in Building 99, and we're talking with Kevin Scott in his workshop. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. I brought my friend Felicia Shaw. She's a PM on Visual Studio. Hey. This hey. is the CTO of the company. Very exciting. I'm super excited. If you're a CTO in a small or medium-sized company, I was the chief architect at my previous company in a company of only about 400. We thought of the CTO as being the most technical, mm. but I feel like that can't be possible. Like you're not trying to be- No, no, no. I think of my job more as uh, being the person that helps uh, a very large community of these tech fellows and distinguished scientists and engineers actually flourish and be technical and do the work that the company needs. And, and it's a, it's really a, it's a nutty sort of team. Like we have <laughs> multiple touring award winners. We have a fields medalist. Uh, we have MacArthur genius uh, grant winners. We have people who've been knighted by the queen uh, of England. Uh, it's sort of crazy, like, what that team actually looks like at Microsoft scale. We're easily the most distinguished people that you're sitting with. I don't think we are. <laughs> we're not even close to distinguished. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Oh, you, <laughs> oh, wow. oh contraire. You guys are awesome. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so you're kind of like a quarterback, right? You're not trying to be the most athletic member of the team, but you're trying to be the one that helps block and tackle and coordinate with the rest of the folks. See how my sports analogy Correct. ran? Correct. Beautiful. Yeah. You, feel, you really feel strongly that AI is, is fundamentally for the good and is going to make major changes in our lives. Oh, I, I do. I, I think it is uh, one of the more powerful tools, uh, technological tools that humans have ever built. And I, I think when we package it up in a way where it is usable by a huge variety of people to solve both small and large problems, like you, you may use it to, you know, build your next web app, or you may use it to figure out how to design a, a bespoke protein that will uh, fend off the next uh, pandemic virus that hits the human race, or figure out how to design a catalyst for carbon capture to help with climate change. Interesting. And is that sort of the role of Microsoft? What do you see Azure playing a role? I think you call it something as the supercomputer of AI. Yeah, the world's AI, world AI supercomputer. AI super supercomputer. What does that yeah. mean to us or to the world? Well, look, the, the fun thing about doing all of this at Microsoft is we've always been a platform company. We build things that other people then take and build on top of to solve the problems that they think are interesting or meaningful or impactful or urgent in their lives. I'm getting surprised all the time by how people use this tool once it's available to them. Uh, and so I think that's the important thing as a platform company is just like make the tools more powerful, make them more available, and then watch in amazement as people smarter than you figure <laughs> out how to use them. Well, you say people smarter than, than us, but you also feel very strongly that everyone can be a developer. 
And that's an interesting Correct. juxtaposition. You're going to take smart people and make them smarter. You're going to take regular people and make them smart. Really, a rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah, I, I think so. Like, what, what you want is more people to have more powerful tools to solve their problems. Uh, and so that, that works for everyone from, you know, the aforementioned uh, Turing Award winners and Fields medalists uh, all the way to, you know, folks like the, the people in my hometown in rural central Virginia who have their own businesses and agriculture and manufacturing and whatnot that they're doing. And like, if they have more powerful tools, they, they're going to be able to make their businesses better. One question that I have is I hear about, you know, AI and AI on an iPhone or uh, AI on a small thing on the edge. But then I also think of AI as being this massive computer refrigerator, you know, in a warehouse somewhere. Help me understand the difference between AI on the edge and what can be in a small package versus me making a web service call to a super brain. Yeah, so I, I think this is one of the really exciting things that both Satya and I talked about at, uh, at Bill this year. So this idea of the hybrid loop of hybrid AI. And so in some cases, like the platform is going to help you uh, run all of your AI, your inference, uh, so to speak, uh, locally, uh, when it's got a really fast MPU that's in your phone or on your laptop. Uh, and when it can't, uh, like the way that we're thinking about architecting these systems is you'll just sort of be able to seamlessly point those uh, inferences into the cloud. And so you will have hardware sitting in the cloud available that will be able to do the work for you. With young developers or young people like coming into the world now with like all these AI powered tools, how do you think that's going to change? You know, like every five years is like this new brand new leap. Yeah. And how do we like grapple with that? Well, I, I think it is there. There's the super serious stuff that we have to think about, which is these models have interesting new flavors of bugs. What we want to do is make these AIs as safe as possible. And like when we let something out into the world that uh, maybe isn't what we intended, that we've got ways to sort of contain and mitigate the impact the same way that we have figured out how to do with really complex classical software. Um, but the thing that I think is super exciting for the young kids, in addition to all of this robust debate, is like, yeah, every five years, like maybe, you know, every two years, uh, the capabilities of these systems are changing in just dramatic ways. Both of you imagine what it was like when you were a teenager writing your first lines of code, like what, what a teenager must feel like right now with like the power of these tools to go do things. Crazy. We brought you to the uh, the Building 99 workshop for a couple of reasons, and I'm going to actually move us. I'm going to pick up our laptop here, and Felicia and I are going to show you some of the cool stuff that we've got over here, because I think there's an analogy to be had. We're here in Alexander Story's hardware workshop in Building 99, and one of the things that he's done for us as a materials scientist and an engineer, I'm going to put you down here, sir. He's got different iterations on some some virtual reality goggles here. And maybe he's got the last, yeah. these, the final versions over here. But you can see he's got so many, 20 different versions. He's always improving and always revising. Does the same thing apply to artificial intelligence models? Oh, oh, for sure. It, it, it is a constant, a constant process of improvement. You're constantly selecting your data, training your model, deploying it into an application, trying to as precisely as possible measure how it's performing, and then using that experimental feedback loop to make everything better. Yeah, actually in, in his office here, let me just adjust your camera a little bit. He's got every 3D printer, every additive <laughs> piece of equipment we could possibly come up with. I don't, do you ever, do you think there's anybody who's ever going to understand the entire complexity of, you know, abstractions that we're building like up the on? Full, like, we always hear about full stack yeah, the, what is, yeah, what That's is not a gonna, thing anymore, yeah. right? They're almost like a compression algorithm that lets you stuff more stuff into your head. Uh, because we all have, like, you know, just a finite amount of complexity that we can fit into our brain at any point in time. So you, you on the one hand, want the tools to become more powerful so you can do more. But, like, you also want to have that skill of being able to, like, oh, this is not a magic black box. Like, some other person wrote this thing, and, like, if I need to, like, I can get under the covers and figure out how it's operating.
I've been giving advice to early in career people to be a T-shaped developer, right? You understand that top uh. part, the, you know, understand compute hasn't changed. CPUs, memory, LAN, like latency, these are all fundamentals. And then pick an area and then go, go deep, deep on the T. Yep. Do you think that's good advice, sir? I, I think that's outstanding advice. Yeah. Super yeah. good. <laughs> And we have that on tape, right? Yeah. I had never <laughs> heard of this before. So. You ever heard of the T-shaped developer? You've never given well, me advice. So people always say, like, should you be an expert in this yeah. one thing? But then if that one thing goes away, yeah. what do you do with your career? And I've always thought of myself as being kind of a Swiss army knife, which is kind of a funny little tool that's mediocre at a lot of different things. But then it goes deep, deep in one on thing. one thing. It's a good knife. We, we, we came here because Felicia and I have an interest in material science and things like that. We try to stay balanced. Do you try to stay balanced between the virtual and the physical? Oh, I, I absolutely do. I, I find uh, doing a bunch of mechanical stuff is very useful. There's this interesting space where the technology meets the physical world, and I think that gets more interesting all the time. If you were to make a prediction, like in 25 years, you know, 25 years before people were like, oh, flying cars, oh, AI, they're going to go do everything. But like, really, if you had to like make a really accurate or like something that's unimaginable today, but we'll, we will be able to solve in the next 25 years. It doesn't have to be something crazy big, but even something simple that we cannot do today. So the thing that I, I will say is I, I don't believe that there's any indication that the rate of progress will slow down. The gaps get broader, broader. So I've got a 13 year old and an 11 year old and I described to them what life, my life was like when I was 11 and 13. And like, they, they just can't even believe it. They're like, what? No tablets, no smartphones, no internet, no, you know, like, yeah. It's How did you just live? Inconceivable Kevin? for them. How did you live? Yeah. What did you do? And you know, so that, that is my prediction. Like, I think we, we will see accelerating change, uh, and, and, the thing that we all should do is sort of embrace that it's coming. Well, I do realize that you probably have a print going or something in the background that you need to go and deal with, but I want to thank you for hanging out with Felicia and I today. This has been super interesting, and I hope that folks who are watching this make sure that they check out your keynote if they haven't already. Thank you, Kevin. It was a pleasure having you. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Hey friends, uh, we're getting towards the end of Build After Hours. We're having all kinds of great fun here. We're here in the green room, in fact, with some of my favorite tech talkers. We invited some of our great tech influencers from TikTok to hang out with us at Build, and we're gonna give you a bunch of cool stuff. We've got some great gifts from our friends at Wilderness Labs, including a Meadow processor that runs .NET directly on a microprocessor. We saw a bunch of cool stuff today. We saw Kevin Scott, we saw Satya. Uh, Hosanna, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm brilliant. What did you see at Build that you're most excited about? I think I'm most excited about Codex because I love that it gives beginners the opportunities to have like the right support to learn to code properly. Very cool. I'm glad. That's great. <laughs> Sophie, you having fun? I'm having a great time, actually. Yes. Um, I think that Build was great and the tour that we got was even better. I really enjoyed the user experience research lab and everything, um, the aspect of human computer interaction that we got to kind of experience and like what goes beyond building products was amazing. I'm glad, that's great. Yeah, building empathy, putting empathy back in products, all of our friends in the developer division, user experience lab. Tala, what did you see that you liked? Um, I think I really loved uh, the Power App stuff. I think in general, um, Power Apps are just like a great innovation and allow people and businesses to build technical solutions really quickly. So I really liked where you can just take a picture and it'll create an app for you. And just always seeing the new innovations with Power Apps really make me happy and excited. I'm glad. Kadesha. Yeah, I really enjoyed seeing the preview of Dolly 2. Uh, being able to input text and generate an image is so cool to me, and I can't wait to be able to use it. That's so cool. All right, well, I hope that you've had a great time, as much fun as we've had here with Build After Hours. Be sure to check out all of our great on-demand sessions. You can check out Build even after Build is over. Be sure to follow all of our Tech Talk friends. You can find them tagged in my most recent Tech Talk. And thanks to our good friends uh, at Wilderness Labs, as well as all the incredibly hardworking people uh, all within Build that make this happen. Thousands and thousands of folks, camera operators, and uh, there's jibs, and there's makeup, and there's uh, the, the control centers, and all the great devs, PMs, testers, and even a vice president or two that work so hard on these products that we brought to you. Thank you very much. It's the end of Build. Yeah. Yeah. Yay! <laughs>